so much for having me. I'm excited to give this talk. Um, so my, my talk has to do with uh, anxiety and things to deal with anxiety. The one thing I don't have in my talk is how to deal with the anxiety of seeing people look at you talking on a Zoom call like this. I'm actually used to giving talks and doing this with my membership, which, hey, Full Harbor members, thanks for joining. It's a bunch of you in here. Um, yeah, I don't have one of those yet. So I'll have to try to figure that out and let you know what I come up with. So this talk is called Five Radical Steps for Anxious Creatives. Yay, anxiety, one of my favorite things. <laughs> um, this is going to be a mix of mindset shifts and different actions that you can take. So I'm excited to share with you. These are things that have personally helped me a ton. And um, yeah, here we go. So if you're one of the anxious types that wants to know what's ahead of you in a talk, this is how many talking points I have, six. And I'm gonna talk about each one for about five minutes and then we'll have time for Q and A afterwards. And a, this is the title of the, the points that I have. I'm not gonna read them out because I'll get to them in just a second. All right, so step one, everything is practice. The anxiety that we'll be dealing with here is you know, the wonderful feeling of crushing pressure. Uh, that's not my favorite at all. But let me ask you a question to start. When do you feel less pressure? During practice or during the championship game? It's kind of an obvious question. Practice. There's a lot less pressure when you're practicing something. The championship game, the pressure is on. By definition, the pressure is on. But we're artists, so we don't really have that championship game that happens to us. So let me ask the question for the artist, the creative. Um, do you feel less pressure following a tutorial? or starting working on a, a project for a dream client. Obviously, following a tutorial, there's a lot less pressure than there is for working with your dream client. And that's because this feels like practice and this feels like the championship game. But what if we change our mind a little and call this working for your dream client also practice? Calling it practice and thinking of it as practice can really help you think about things in terms of like less pressure. Um, it's a mindset shift. It's not like a thing that will automatically happen. It's the thing that you have to work on every time you, you start feeling the pressure of the current situation, um, because this is gonna be practice for what comes next, which we may not know what's gonna come next. Um, it could be starting your dream company, which of course is the championship game, except it's not, that's just practice for whatever comes next. There's always something that comes next. And what you do now is something that's just ends up kind of being practiced for the next thing. It doesn't feel like it in the moment, but when you look back, it's like, oh, that really helped help prepare me for whatever I'm doing now. Um, another question, what stops you from doing what you want? Um, for most of us, uh, most of the time, it's something to do with fear of failure. And when you think of everything as practice for what's next, failure fades. This is my uh, version of a Venn diagram. It's very scientific. <laughs> when you have practice and failure, like they don't overlap a whole lot. Um, when you think of everything as practice, the, the fear of failure fades away because it's just, they don't really go together. Um, one version of me taking this into my own life was I knew that I wanted to get better at talking on camera, kind of like right now. And before I ever gave any kind of talk or created like a, a video for YouTube, I started just using Snapchat. I had about 15 followers and only a third of them watched the stuff I made. So five people would watch me and it was low pressure. So I made Snapchat videos moved on to Instagram stories where I had a more sizable audience, but I felt more comfortable because I was practicing with Snapchat. Snapchat wasn't the end game. It was just practice for something that was going to come next. Same thing with uh, Instagram stories led to me making full on vlogs, fully edited videos, and then tutorials, which led to courses. And I've been on podcasts and now I'm doing a talk. Like um, it's like, I even see this as practice. I've had some nervousness about this talk, but I know this is practice for the next thing. So that helps me, you know, not feel so bad. Plus, I don't think any of you will kill me or eat me if I don't do a good job. But uh, uh, that's a, uh, like, even right now, I feel like I'm stumbling. This is just uh, me being honest about um, what it feels like to uh, take uh, the, the thing of practice into to account. So I like this quote from uh, Frank Wilczek. 
if you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems. And that's a big mistake. Um, when you think of something as practice, the failure is something that is more easy to, uh, to take in. And that means that you're going to be able to make mistakes and move forward. Because if you're not making mistakes, as a good old Frank here says, that's a big problem. You should listen to him. He was the 2004 Nobel Prize winner in physics. Step two, be the lion, not the cow. This anxiety is dealing with burnout. So be the lion, not the cow. The cow spends all day eating grass. It's moving here. It's moving there. It's eating this patch. It's eating that patch. It never stops eating grass. It's just eating grass all the time. The lion puts forth enormous energy into a kill all at once, just all the energy it can. It's not going to just like, oh, just maybe I'll try to eat a little here and there. No, it goes for it. And then they enjoy their meal and then they relax. The cow represents burnout. The lion represents having a healthy relationship with work and rest. The way that we work out our muscles, we do workouts every once in a while. Some of us more frequently than others. I won't say what camp I'm in uh, because I'm not in the camp that I want to be in. But anyways, uh, yeah, I, th I think that it's a really healthy space to attack a creative problem, to really put your all into it, be fully engaged in it, and then disconnect. And it's okay to take breaks. It's okay and good to take breaks from creating. Uh, I think we've all felt some level of weird burnout, um, whether it's burnout from reading the news, uh, dealing with the, the whole year has been insane. So I know that this is kind of a, a relevant topic and that the, the key to taking breaks from work is having guilt-free play. We all have distractions that we, you know, indulge in Instagram, checking email constantly, keeping email open, having email notifications on. That's a, whew, that's a crazy thing. Um, Twitter, procrastinating, cleaning, YouTube photos, anything, anything that's a distraction is time that you could have spent having some guilt-free playtime. And I realized that once um, quarantine hit, I actually don't have any hobbies. Like I skateboard, but I don't know if there's a hobby. I don't know. It's the thing I do, but I almost have no other hobbies. Um, but recently I've been developing this uh, habit. This is one of those actions. Um, it's a mindset and an action because I want you to take time and do something fun and feel no guilt doing it. Um, some examples for me, I've been playing rocket league. Thank you to my wife and my sister-in-law for helping me get a switch for my birthday. Um, I'm not a gamer, but uh, I've thoroughly been enjoying playing rocket league. Hit me up later on Instagram. If you play rocket league, I'd love to play with you. Um, I've been reading fiction. I've never done that before. Uh, not since school. And I've been, I don't know, I've read, this is not all of them. I think I've read about six fiction books since quarantine started and it's just uh, life-giving. It's amazing. Puzzles. I used to think puzzles were kind of cool for a second, but then what's the point? Because you're just going to tear them down. And I'm learning that guilt-free play doesn't have to produce anything productive. It can just be enjoyable for the sake of being enjoyable. Also Gilmore Girls. Uh, my wife and I have been watching all of this episodes of Gilmore Girls. She may be of watching all, more of them than I am, but we're both team Jess. Hey, yo. And uh, a lot of times I've been giving myself an hour of uh, an hour to think and write. And this has been a beautiful time. I do that in the morning. I light this incense. I have my coffee and I just, I don't, there's nothing. I don't have to do anything. It's guilt free. And you may think, thinking and writing time is play. Well, like, yeah, I love thinking. I just love sitting and thinking and giving myself that time. Sometimes I feel really guilty for doing it. So giving myself an hour to do it has been wonderful. Also a little bonus one here, spooky fun. You don't have to do things that are spooky fun, except, you know, the uh, October time is great for that. But what was really fun about this was I was not doing this for Instagram. I was not doing this for a client. It was just like, oh, I can be creative with this stuff. We went out and bought a few things, drew some stuff on the sidewalk, and our neighbors enjoyed it, and it was super fun. So how would you spend a guilt-free hour today? If you had an hour to do nothing, how would you do it? If you don't know what you would do, you can borrow some of my guilt-free things or ask other people. Um, I think it's really healthy to develop stuff that you can do during your guilt-free time. 
Zoom fatigue break. I want everybody to stand up for a second. I'm going to stop sharing. Hey, Dana. Stand up. Yes. I may or may not have put that in there just so that I could get some of my own jitters out. <laughs> so step three is the airplane trick. This is one of my favorites. This one deals with discontent and comparison. Um, anybody who's on social media deals with some kind of comparisonitis uh, and feeling discontent with what you have. And so this airplane trick is very helpful for that. So I want you to imagine something with me. You're boarding your flight from New York City to London. It's a seven hour flight. And lucky for you, you've been bumped up to first class for free. But this is no ordinary first class. You have a couch, a 10 foot office, a stocked kitchen, a bathroom, and your own shower that you get to use as much as you want. Wow. <laughs> they let you know that this suite retails for $32,000 per flight. It's insane. I know what you're going to do too with your 32,000 super premium first class suite. You're going to take a million photos and you're going to bask in the unimaginable once in a lifetime mile high luxury. This is insane. I mean, mind blowing. Here's the trick. You already have this. Whatever office you're sitting in, whether it's a bedroom, a small office, a little nook off the kitchen, you have something that would, if that was in an airplane, would be absolutely insane. And you would be taking photos and sending pictures to your friends and sticking on your Instagram stories. And people would think that you're just a high roller and that you hit the jackpot. Uh, I actually use this trick a lot. Anytime that I go, oh, I wish we could move into a nicer house or that apartment off the lake is really cool. I just realized like, oh my gosh, what I have now is insane. It's so cool. Like I have, I have a room to sit in and do my work. I can close the door, whatever it is you have. Um, if you picture it on an airplane, that's what I call the airplane trick. And it is very, very helpful for uh, reducing the anxiety you feel when you're comparing, when comparing what you have to what you want or what other, pe other people have. All right. Step four, radical acceptance. Um, this deals with uh, the feeling of being out of control as well as suffering. So this is a story where my friend said something quite hurtful to me um, several months ago. And when I read what he said to me, I just like my eyes got wide. My breath got long. Uh, my heart was just beating. And I was like, how could this, my friend say that to me like that? It really, really hurt. There was a lot of pain. Um, fortunately for me, I was in the middle of reading a book called The Four Agreements, which I thousand percent recommend. Um, quickly, The Four Agreements are be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions and always do your best. I had just finished reading the chapter on don't make assumptions, which pairs perfectly with don't take anything personally. And dovetailed into the scenario that I found myself with my friend who had just said something really hurtful to me. And so I took a breath and I said, okay, I'm not going to take this personally. This has more to do with him than it does with me. Um, and I'm not going to make an assumption. I'm, maybe I'm making an assumption that he's meaning to be mean, that he's meaning to hurt me. And so I asked some clarifying questions and within the course of five minutes, and actually my wife was sitting there watching me. She saw the comment come in and, um, it cleared up like immediately I had made an assumption and he hadn't been being mean to me. I just, I totally, I misread it. And um, it, it, the, the, the issue resolved. Um, so to me, these agreements have been incredibly helpful. I've used this multiple times since then, and it hasn't been too long since I've read it. Um, anyways, it's a fantastic read and it's a, uh, it's amazing what the, the four agreements can do for you. And this, this works towards radical acceptance because this is a way to take something painful and not suffer with it. Um, but what happens if he really did mean something mean and, you know, I got clarity on like, he is mad at me. He hates me. He, whatever it is, that friend, what if, what if things fell apart 
and there's nothing I could do about it. Uh, radical acceptance says that pain does not have to equal suffering. Um, acknowledging if that had happened, I would have to acknowledge the reality of the situation and allow myself to experience that pain and let it move through me like a passing of a storm. That's a really beautiful way to process things that are painful. I'm not going to claim that it works in every situation. Um, this is a very new concept to me, but it's been incredibly helpful to, to, to recognize that pain does not have to equal suffering. Suffering is what happens in your mind and your reaction to things um, rather than just the, the experience itself. Pain is part of life, but suffering doesn't have to be part of it. I don't think it'll always go away, but uh, this is definitely something, it's kind of a coping mechanism, I guess. And this quote comes from Tara Brack, the author of the book. I think I'm pretty sure she wrote the book called Radical Acceptance. Uh, I love this quote. Staying occupied is a socially sanctioned way of remaining distant from our pain. If you've ever found yourself doing those things I listed before as distractions, Instagram, checking your email constantly, always being busy, always doing something. Um, if you find yourself in that space, check to see if you're trying to disconnect from something that's painful, um, something that you may be suffering uh, emotionally from and um, be willing to kind of move through that pain. Uh, I know that I've kept myself busy many, many times because I wanted to avoid the thing that's that I needed to deal with. Um, and that's very, very easy to do these days. I also wanted to point out that uh, my quote lined up kind of weirdly with a, uh, social distancing these days. That's all. <laughs> all right. Step five, decisive decision-making. This is a good one. Um, this one deals with indecision. Makes sense. So I run a class called the personal project accelerator, where I help motion designers finish a personal project in four weeks. Uh, one of the things that I hammer home in every single call that we have is decisive decision-making is an underrated skill. In fact, I have them recite that to me as kind of a pop quiz every single time we call. It's like the most important part of the whole class. Now they have a consequence if they don't do their homework. So there's homework every Sunday for four weeks. And at the end of that homework, if you do all of the homework, you have a personal project at the end. The consequence for not doing that is $100. They have to give me $100 that I'll then give to a charity of my choice, which I also make them think I don't tell them what the, the charity is because I want them to think that it's something they really don't want the money going towards. It's a negative consequence. And so they have this, this thing that's sitting there going, crap, that's a bad consequence that I do not want. And um, the only way that they're going to experience, like not experience that pain of taking the, getting the hundred dollars taken away from them is if they're making decisive decisions every week. Um, so the, the problem with indecision is that it can be anxiety inducing and sends you in a never ending downward spiral of shame and guilt and all the bad things. <laughs> uh, we don't like feeling these things and indecision is something that if we don't have like a project, if we're dealing with something that's, you know, starting a new uh, side project, starting something that no one's asking you for indecision is going to send you into this anxiety inducing downward spiral. But what decisive decision-making does is it moves you beyond the decision. Um, mulling over the decision is what gives you anxiety. It takes you into action when you're engaged in something, when you're fully in the thing, you're not having, you're, you're not able to experience the anxiety. It's kind of like that thing before where I said practice and fear or practice and failure don't really go together. Um, being fully engaged in something and anxiety often don't mix at the same time. It's hard to like both smile and laugh and be like devastated. Um, this also, you know, leaving only a trace amount of anxiety. It won't, it won't take everything away, but I've found that it is incredibly helpful. And actually it's something that my students have said uh, beyond the class that are, if they're in my full Harbor membership, uh, we meet every week and I hear the word decisive decision-making I made a decisive decision all the time. And so I know that it's made a pretty big impact on people. Speed is a much better friend 
spent overanalyzing the shit out of every decision you have to make and never really making a decision in the end, which causes you to self-doubt and completely give up. Um, speed is much better than sitting in the muck of indecision and just feeling bad about yourself. It is possible to just make a decision and move on. In the case that you cannot make a decision, you just really don't know if you should do this or that. Text a friend and just say red or blue. Red's going to associate to one of your options and blue will associate to the other. They don't know which one it is. And they'll say blue. And you'll say, thanks. Mwah. Appreciate it. Now, if you hate that they chose blue and you're like, dang it, I wish they chose red. Well, you get to choose red. <laughs> Nobody knows that this happened. Um, this just gives you that gut feeling of like, okay, cool. Or, oh no, I definitely can't do that. Um, and that's, to me, that's been a really, really helpful uh, tip. I've actually had a friend uh, that I text back and forth with who we do this relatively frequently. That's really helpful. Yay. We've defeated anxiety. <laughs> well, we've maybe diminished anxiety at least a little bit. Um, so here's my, my secret, my super secret bonus tip. Ride your own wave. So uh, to ride your own wave, I, the first step is you need to surf your wave. This means you can't just be on the pier looking at your wave or watching Instagram videos of other people riding waves. You need to be surfing your wave, not even sitting in the ocean on your surfboard, but surfing the wave. Um, this means two things to me. One, you're doing the action. You're taking action towards what you want to do. Um, you're not thinking of, you're not, yeah, you're not mulling over in indecision. You're actually surfing the wave. doesn't matter how well you're surfing it or how big your wave is, but you're surfing the wave. The other thing this means to me is when you are surfing the wave, you're at the edge of your competency. You're at the edge of your ability and your comfort zone, and you're moving forward. Um, that's where growth comes from is when you're right at the edge. If you're a little too far behind the wave, you're not going to gain momentum. You're going to be sitting in that stagnant place where you're comfortable, but like, let's say you're a freelancer and you've been doing the same client work. You know how to do it. You're just chugging through the work, but it's not thrilling. It's not exciting. It's not challenging. You're not growing. But if you're taking on the most insane projects and you have no idea what you're doing, you're going to burn out because you have no idea what you're doing. And it can be very, very stressful. So if you can stay at that, that really great spot of surfing the wave, I should put it into a, a, a surfing analogy. If you're too far forward, the wave's going to crash on you. Um, you're going to tumble. Um, so if you're surfing the wave, you're at that that great spot of uh, yeah, being at the edge of your abilities. But you should also take breaks. Surf your wave, but then go lay down on the beach, soak up the sun, drink your margaritas, um, put plenty of sunscreen on, enjoy your time off, but then go back to the wave. Um, it's also better to be in the surf competition than to just watch the surf competition. Again, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. Surfing in the competition is going to be more enjoyable than just wishing that you were. Thank you. Be radical. Ride your own wave. <laughs>